Jenny, are you the one that makes nice spaces for me? No, that was Tom. Oh. That was Tom. You guys don't have to do I th that. I think about how nice that is, though. I love it. I like negative space, so I'm a huge fan of it. Yeah. It's a positive negative space. It's a negative positive. Banana phone. <laughs> All right, here we go. Ready? Yep. Well, that didn't work. What? <laughs> I forgot to turn it up. Here we go. Podcasts about technology in your daily lives from people who like to put pants on frogs and one guy with a trustworthy looking beard. The Daily Tech News Show with Tom Merritt is brought to you by you and I at dailytechnewsshow.com slash donate. This is the Daily Tech News, and it is Wednesday, July 1st, 2015. I'm Tom Merritt. Joining me today, Scott Johnson, DTNS contributor and a chief frog pantser. How's it going, Scott Johnson? Wednesday, 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 and I'm thrilled to be here, stoked to be with you, and looking forward to whatever today may hold. We have a slam bang lineup of worldwide tech news, always on, <laughs> uh, including Peter Wells coming to us from the early morning of tomorrow in Australia. How's it going, Peter? It's going very, very well, Tom. How are you, sir? How are you, Scott? Doing great. It's good to have Thanks. you here. What time is it there? It's like 6 a.m. You're a crazy person. <laughs> Yeah, 632. Uh, well, this is this is a little bit more worldwide than uh, Apple's version of worldwide, which is New York, LA, and London. Um, so this is a little bit nicer. You know, we've actually they got... skipped a hemisphere, didn't they? <laughs> hmm. Yeah, they seem to miss us quite a bit, but that's okay. Hmm. We're used to it by now. Yeah. I mean, at least Brasilia or Johannesburg, <laughs> if not somewhere in Australia. Yeah. But come on, I don't know. Well, they did put a New Zealander really... in charge hmm. of the place, right? Yeah, I guess so. But, you know, he's been out of the country for a very long time, so. Yeah, he, yeah, he has. And, and by the way, to everyone who pointed out that my pale imitation of Zane Lowe yesterday uh, was in no way a New Zealand accent, believe me. You didn't want to hear me even. You didn't want to hear me do what I did. You certainly didn't want me to make it worse by me trying to do a Kiwi accent. So, sure. and they uh, could always expand it. Who knows? Paul Hogan, the DJ, the nighttime <laughs> oh. Australian audience. I'm ready for it. Fantastic. All right. Uh, well, promise. Uh, not a ton of Apple Music conversation today, but there is some from you guys who wrote in with thoughts about it. We'll get to that later on in the show. We're going to talk about some Minecraft educational opportunities after the headlines. The Verge reports on an update rolling out to Snapchat on Android and iOS today. Among the changes, you no longer have to keep your finger on the screen to view snaps and stories. There are also two new ways to add friends. One called Add Nearby finds anyone else who happens to be looking at the Add Nearby feature while they are in your vicinity. The other lets you use a screenshot of a QR code to add someone. Not just pointing your camera at a QR code, but if you have it in your camera roll, you can pull it in as an image. Um, let's get back to this, though. Peter Wells, you don't have to hold your finger on the Snapchat anymore. That just changes everything. It does. It does. But they needed to do this for um, accessibility reasons. Uh, you know, they, they've said that on stage. So, um, yeah, it, it is weird when, you know, something that's so, so kind of, uh, I don't know, is, is the idea that you always approach an app to um, changes like this, but, you know, I guess they had to do it. I really like this uh, nearby feature. I think that, that could be, uh, I work at a university, I could see uh, that location-based stuff uh, becoming pretty big amongst the students we have on, on campus, sorry. Yeah, it's weird. I, I, it's funny because the mechanism, the primary mechanism has always been to hold that thing down. But mm. this, this to me is just one step in many where they have, that they've taken to get away from being this little secret image share thing to something much more large and broad. And uh, I think they have to kind of slowly evolve it. You do it all at once and you'll freak out your, your user base. But I think in a couple of years it will not be anything like the uh, app it used to be in my opinion. Well, that's so, smart. Yeah, I think so. Scott, yeah. Does that mean we will see the, uh, the little... Uh, what, is, what is it, the ghost, the jelly man uh, disappear then? Uh, is that ever going to go away? I hope no. so, because it's ugly and dumb. I would, uh, yeah, it's not think, going anywhere. It's an no. ugly icon. <laughs> not very well made. So to me, it's like the Reddit logo. One day, that mm -hmm. Reddit logo, out of here, man. That thing is bad. Anyway. I do think the uh, nearby feature is cleverly done where it's not just everyone nearby, so it's not constantly pinging your location. It's only when you're in that feature, which means you kind of have to be talking like, oh, hey, what's you, what are you on Snapchat? Well, hold on. I'll just launch nearby. You launch nearby, and then I'll find you easily. Yeah, that stuff's kind of cool. Yeah. 
Or, or if you're bored enough to be in that menu, then um, maybe you'll see some <laughs> You're obviously looking enough. for friends, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah really bored. Uh, Fortune is reporting Facebook changed its logo. What? Did anybody notice? I did because I'm a typography nerd. But anyway, the A in Facebook is now a simpler single-story A. The letters are slimmer. There's more white space. It's basically a different font if you just want to look at it in a very simple way. Facebook apparently wanted to modernize the logo and make it more suitable for viewing on mobile. Um, and now it sinks in that you guys were trying to transition to this story when you were talking about changing. Ding! <laughs> Got it right. I'm <laughs> slow. Uh, well, we learned from the master, Tom. Uh, <laughs> yeah. the, uh, the, uh, the change is funny because if you hold the old logo up to the new logo, and if you look at them separately, you're not even thinking about it. It's no big deal. But those two different kinds of A's really stand out if you're comparing them. And now it feels weird to see the old one. So, uh, you know, whatever. Companies make these small changes all the time. Speaking about a small incremental change that no one will notice, this is like, you know, lead story for that. But in typography circles, this sort of thing makes sense, and I think it's fine. Good on them. Recode reports Facebook is offering a few dozen partners 55% of revenue from ads shown next to certain videos that starts this autumn. Selected partners like the NBA or Funny or Die will be able to make money off videos featured in a new area called Suggested Videos. It's kind of like a news feed for videos. Ads in the Suggested Video feed are independent. They're not pre-rolls, but they are autoplay. So as you scroll past them, they start playing. Uh, and the feature comes to iOS within weeks. Android on the web in a few months. Uh, the, the revenue from a particular ad would be split up to whatever videos you watched in proc in in the same part of the feed, so it could be split amongst various videos. Everyone's, I think, rightly considering this a uh, shot against YouTube, or or at least Facebook's way of trying to get a little of that ad money that YouTube gets. But I don't know that it's exact. I, I think it's a clear difference uh, of approach from YouTube. A because it's going after high level partners at the beginning, and B because I think it's less intrusive than a pre roll, frankly. Yeah, my prediction is this. And Peter, you can, I want you to argue this if you think I'm wrong. But my prediction is they'll roll this out. Everyone on Facebook will freak out for about seven days and say they're going to quit. They're going to go somewhere else. They're going to have a big canary. And then everyone will stop talking about it. They will have stayed on Facebook, and no one will talk about it again. See, I, I will argue. I don't even think people will uh, freak out about this uh, just because I, I've got to hand it to Justin Robert Young, actually, that um, I cannot believe that Facebook pulled off autoplay video uh, and... And made it work. I mean, I, I, I know I spend more time in Facebook these days. I'm not a huge Facebook fan myself, but um, I do spend more time these days, and I'll and I will sit and watch silently as that video starts as I'm scrolling through my feed. Um, and I've watched stuff that I would never normally have clicked on in the past. Um, that that you know, it's it's just intriguing enough in those first few seconds that I'll I'll stop scrolling and I'll sit down and watch that video. So I can see myself, yeah, getting right into this. I mean, the the they're all it's all North American content at this stage, but um, I could definitely see myself uh, wasting even more time in Facebook, which is exactly what they want. Well, uh, be ready because it's coming. Mark German of Nine to Five Mac is at it again with two new rumors about the next iPhone. It'll start uh, with the first one here. German's source showed him a picture of the logic board with Qualcomm's 9X35 Gobi mo uh, modem platform. That chip is more powerful and efficient and smaller, and the best part is it supports LTE -E speeds up to 300 megabits per second. Uh, there's some rumors or there's some talk floating around that this also frees up room for additional battery space, uh, but that's uh, sort of an unsourced rumor. Um, yeah, hey, guess what, guys? New iPhone coming, new, uh, a new chip in it. So it's probably going to look totally different, right? Well, no. The source image shows a case for the next iPhone almost identical in size and design to the current iPhone 6 and 6 Pluses. Uh, everything else, camera holes, connectors, speakers, mic, all of it's the same. So how do you know it's not just a picture of the uh, current iPhone case? Well, there is different internal mounting structure. And, uh, of course, Mark Garman has trust in his sources. Uh, but, yeah, it sounds like more power, not more powerful so much as more power efficient. So we have you, possibly better battery life and faster. Do, do you think the ba battery savings though will be passed on to us? I mean, I know the uh, say the Samsung Galaxy S6 had a better battery than the S5, but by the time 
it came out, the battery life was actually worse because it's powering a more powerful screen, more pixels, brighter screen. Uh, so, you know, uh, do you think that uh, Apple will just take back all of the, those battery gains that they find with this well, new they, chip? They tend to be, this is one thing I, I'll give Apple uh, some big credit for. They've always been pretty straight up about how battery's going to work. And what they usually estimate on stage is typically what we get. And that's not always the case with a lot of manufacturers. They'll, they'll promise something, and then, you know, it, there's a lot of sort of asterisks and, you know, footnotes about these conditions that somehow this battery was, was charged or uncharged under. And they've always been pretty straight up on that. I also think we've seen a trend with them as they've gotten further and further down the line that new phones have bigger batteries because the features they're adding to the phone require them or the chips that are in the phone are less power intensive, so you're, you know, saving some, some stuff there. But... I think they know there's a certain threshold, and if it goes any lower than that, that people mm. are going to be very unhappy. Um, for current, you know, for a brand new phone, there's an expectation of full day use. If they start start undercutting that too much, nobody's happy in that ecosystem. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think they'll ever go under the kind of 10 hour um, battery, which is seems to be what they've been aiming for for the last couple of uh, generations. But uh, yeah, I, I, I'm wondering. I just wonder if. Uh, you know, when, I don't know if you saw uh, Phil Schiller on uh, Gruber's show, but you know, he, he was mentioning the fact that he they are listening to uh, the, the calls for better battery life and not always going for a thinner phone. Um, and I'm wondering if they're going to take that to heart. Yeah, well, the six plus battery life is apparently quite good. It's the iPhone six battery life that's not terribly different. And I feel like when you're in these talk cycles where you don't change the design, but you put a feature in like Siri or the fingerprint mm -hmm. identification, that upping the battery life is another way to maybe encourage people to adopt the new phone. Yeah, and they often bring that up on stage. Uh, check this out. PC Magazine's reporting something. It's something I'm excited about, actually. YouTube has announced you can now watch live video at 60 frames per non, second. Non-live. Did I say live? I meant non. Non-live. Man, we get emails about that. Uh, 60 frames <laughs> per second and it's Android and iOS apps. The higher frame rate was already available on the desktop and has been for a while. Apple TV and PlayStation as well. It's not available for mobile web or third-party apps yet, but important to note, gamers are excited about this because uh, their games will now run at a glorious 60 frames per second. They can record that way, upload it to YouTube and have it retained that way, and now watched on mobile that way. So, very exciting. I'm actually more concerned, or not concerned, but curious if they'll integrate 60 frames per second in their new uh, YouTube games thing uh, initiative, which launches soon. Uh, Twitch offers that now for their live streaming service, so 60 frames per second live would be really nice, but for now, it's all on demand. And this is just YouTube. It's not the gaming app, which is still in beta. Right. So, I imagine this is a, a way of, of just extending those features to all the apps. It'll be interesting to see if they, they do bring live streaming to these apps as well. That would be good. And you kind of need it if you want that gaming app to compete with Twitch in the live set. It's arena. TechCrunch reports a regional court in Austria. Austria, not Australia. Uh, this court ruled as inadmissible a class action lawsuit brought against Facebook by Max Schrems. The suit claimed Facebook had violated EU's privacy protection laws and data protection laws. The Austrian court said it had no jurisdiction in the case because Facebook's headquarters is in Dublin and the case should be filed in Ireland. The judge also raised questions about Schrems' status as a private individual, saying that he organizes vocal protests against privacy violators, uh, and so he might be considered a public figure rather than a private citizen, uh, which I thought was odd. Uh, everyone, including Max Schrems, says they're going to appeal the ruling and that they found the argument rather strange. I wonder what the, the threshold for that is. Could somebody come after you or me as a podcaster because we have some public footprint and do terrible litigious things to us because... Well, no, it's, it's the reverse, right? Schrems is trying to say, I'm just a citizen of the EU and so I can bring a class action lawsuit against Facebook. And mm -hmm. the court's saying, I don't know that you're just a citizen of the EU. You seem to be leading an organization. Yeah. So yeah. we don't know that you can be a member of the class. In other words, a lawyer can't be a member of the class, right? Because he's a lawyer. He's an officer of the court. Right. Yeah, it's interesting. I'm just thinking if I, let's say I wanted to, to do, a, a, I don't know, I want to sue the people who made it possible for these voles to get in my window well and die, <laughs> which happened yesterday. So let's say that's something I want to do. Can't, could somebody legally say, well, hold on a minute. You're not just a concerned citizen here, even though in the context of the dead rat I am, but you're a guy who has some public 
some sort of public, you know, standing or whatever. I just wonder how what that threshold is because at some point you're not, and then you are, and I don't know what that, you know, that's well, that, I, I, it's different in every country, and I don't know in your vol case. Uh, I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> how that would work out. But I, I could say that I see where they're going with Max Schrems, which is he's trying to bring the case saying, I'm one of the class. And they are, I, I don't think it's right, but they are saying, well, are you one yeah. of the class or are you the guy leading the class? Like if you ran a uh, competitive vol removal service, uh, <laughs> then I don't think you could be one of the class. They would, they'd kick me out of the court for making bad metaphors. That's all. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, Reuters reports India's prime minister, and I'm not going to say his name. Narendra right. Modi. Thank you. Is leading a digital week meant to deliver on a campaign promise to co connect 250,000 villages in India by 2019. That is right around the corner in, in those kinds of uh, contexts. Officials will announce billions of dollars in investment and plans to stop net imports of technology and electronics by 2020. This is all with the aim of creating 100 million jobs. And before this week, the main thing these guys focused on, or the government had been credited for, was bringing Wi-Fi to the Taj Mahal. Free Wi-Fi, particularly. Free wow, that's great. Yeah. So who, who benefits from that? Tourists and things? Uh, I, yeah, anybody who goes to the Taj Mahal and wants to use Wi-Fi, I guess. All right. Interesting. Nobody lives in there, though, right? <laughs> I don't know how it goes. There. <laughs> there probably are a few people living in there, but I imagine it's without permission. All right. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, this is, uh, uh, Narendra Modi uh, campaigned in, in part on bringing India, you know, a digital revolution. And so this is the week where he tries to convince people that he meant it. All right. Bring it on. In, the Independent reports that Aaron, the administrator for IP addresses in North America, has become the last regional registry to activate its unmet requests policy. That means somebody requested more available IPv4 addresses in a block than they had to give. Uh, while Aaron has some smaller blocks of addresses available, the organization is encouraging companies to make use of the IPv4 transfer market or, you know, maybe switch to IPv6 already. Yeah, what are you guys waiting for? Jeez. The Wrap reports that the full-length trailer for the feature film called Steve Jobs, they're real subtle on that title, uh, was released today. The trailer features Michael Fassbender as Jobs. I was actually led to believe by a little bit of link bait that it, he was unrecognizable as Michael Ooh, Fassbender. So recognizable, and yeah. He is entirely <laughs> recognizable as freaking Magneto. What the crap are they talking about? Anyway, and Seth Rogen yelling, I mean playing Steve Wozniak. He looked real sad. This is a very sad Steve Wozniak. Uh, he was unrecognizable, Scott. <laughs> as Steve Wozniak, maybe, yeah. <laughs> It's a little like the Green Hornet. Couldn't figure it out. Anyway, uh, <laughs> it has an October 9th release date. It's directed by Danny Boyle. Uh, it's another thing I'll say is this the most, the least Danny Boyle looking trailer I've ever seen, as Danny Boyle movies go anyway. Written by the Social Network screenwriter Aaron Sorkin, West Wing, Sports Night, all these good shows. No uh, truth to the rumors that Aaron Sorkin's next movie is about the founding of LinkedIn. Come on, Reed. No one's going to want that many emails. <laughs> Uh, I please make that happen now. Uh, I, I would like that to happen. Did, did you guys watch the trailer? I watched it and I felt like, oh, okay. So they're telling the Steve Jobs story. Um, yeah, but it feels like they're just telling me. I can't tell what they're telling. I can't tell. You know, a lot of all the talk early on was, oh, this will be based in part on uh, what's his name's biography. And mm. uh, well, uh, was it Walt Simonson's? Yeah, no. Who was it? Walter Isaacson. Isaacson. Simonson. What am I saying? Um, and, and I'm not feeling that. I'm feeling less early life, more uh, revolutionary, come back to the company, maybe maybe sort of depict him getting booted by um, Dumber. <laughs> I can't think of his name, actor. <laughs> Jeff Daniels? <laughs> Jeff Daniels. Yeah. Uh, getting booted by him and then sort of forward from that, which is all very interesting to me, but I can't, I can't really get a... Honestly, Tom, I don't have a pulse on this. I don't know what to think yet. Mm. Well, it, it definitely, I think you're right there, Scott, that it, it feels a hell of a lot more Sorkin than it feels any anything like a Danny Boyle uh, pick. But, I mean, it, it's got to be better than the Ashton Kutcher thing. But, um, I mean, I don't think that's a huge hurdle to, to cross. But, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It's not. I'm not feeling it right now. Apparently, the, the hook of the movie is it's actually uh, set between, it's just three nights of keynotes. So, uh, you know, it's all, all going to be putting on a show which also Sorkin loves to do. so. But clearly yeah. some flashbacks and stuff because he's, you know, got different mm -hmm. hair in different scenes and there are people at different ages being depicted or whatever. So, yeah, I, 
I mean, I really like Sorkin, and I really like Danny Boyle, so, and I really like Fassbender, so I feel like the, all the ingredients are there for something rad, but um, I, I don't know, the trailer, and all, tra you know, trailers, what are they good for sometimes? And maybe that's just, it's just not enough to show it here, but I'm, I'm nonetheless going to see it, and hopefully we'll enjoy it. Watch it. Don't watch it. It's entirely up to you. Like what you want to watch. <laughs> New numbers from the Cantor World Panel for the quarter ending in May show Android gaining back 2.8 percentage points in market share in the United States for a total of 64.9%. Credit is given to strong sales of the Samsung Galaxy S6 in that market. Android dropped 2.9 points in Europe, though, uh, at least in the Europe Big Five markets. Cantor puts together Great Britain, Germany, France, Italy, and Spain uh, into one big number bundle. The iPhone 6 topped the charts in all those markets except for Spain. In China, Apple, Huawei, and Xiaomi were the top three in order, all within a half percentage point of each other. So that's a smartphone eat smartphone market over there. It's interesting to see this, the shift and to see almost the identical growth here versus drop over there. It's also, you reminding me that if I could just have Tom Merritt tag around with me all day and pronounce all my unpronounceable words, I'd be a better <laughs> Xiaomi. <laughs> Xiaomi. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Dude. We see quite a few uh, Huawei's down here, and that's how we say it down here, by the way, Scott. Huawei. Uh, but yes, uh, yeah, quite a few Huawei's uh, kicking around in a uh, good old Sydney town. Uh, but we we do have a huge um, Chinese population, so I, I, I have seen. You know, the, I, I love the the M8. I, I know the M7. I think it's called the Mate 7. Is this gigantic Huawei phone? You can't miss it when you see one on a train. Let's take a look at some news from you that come from our subreddit, dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com, as do many other stories within the lineup. Abituela Kundulse reports that the FBI is searching for suspects who have been cutting fiber optic cables in California's Bay Area, disrupting Internet service as far north as Seattle as a result. Wall Street Journal reports that cables in Livermore, California, were severed early Tuesday morning, causing disruption to Microsoft's Azure cloud computing service and to services provided by Hurricane Electric and Wave Broadband. Whoa, physical cutting. Uh, there start was even shooting in San Jose where they shot Whoa. out power transformers. Like, oh. this is a weird mystery here. Yeah. Well, I, you know what? I, uh, I had a, a forecast kicking around in my head about the idea that hacking would stop coming from brilliant coders and we'd start seeing, like, physical takedown of facility type stuff, infrastructure, and maybe it's all come true. Star Fury Zeta passed along the Ars Technica story that starting today, hundreds of mobile apps will be allowed to be sold in the Google Play and Firefox apps. Will store. not be allowed. Will to be not. Sold. I only correct you because it's entirely the opposite of what you say. <laughs> so, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, don't be sorry. I miss thoughts every time uh, because they have been refused classification. They will not be allowed. Uh, it's a pilot program that requires all apps to be rated by the International Age Rating Coalition, or the ARC. ARC for short. Those refused cl uh, uh, classification cannot be sold in participating app stores. So if you want to play Shroom Tycoon, or is this right, Pop Pet? Or is that, okay. Looks like you'll have to sideload. Yeah, all your dirty apps, man. Got to go another way. <laughs> <laughs> so have you, been, uh, have you been keeping up on this story? This is your, your neck of the woods, Peter. I have, but uh, oh, you're talking to Peter, but I just want to say. Yeah, because this is in Australia. Never heard of Pop Pet. Explain that too, Peter. I, look, hey, I, I don't know about Poppet either, but um, yeah, we, we we do have a um, a classifications board for uh, games that basically uh, it, it, you are refused classification if you go over the R rating, which is uh, anything to deal with do with sex and um, uh, well, basically, yeah, depictions of sex will kind of uh, make sure a game gets banned in this country. Um, but you know, it's better than we used to have. You, we used to have quite a few games refuse classification uh, based on violence. That generally doesn't happen anymore. But yeah, interesting. Interesting to see. Uh, th this is actually a voluntary... Uh, I believe this is a voluntary thing because uh, the government kind of doesn't want to spend the money reviewing games anymore, uh, especially when it, when it comes to um, a, mo a market as big as mobile gaming that they've, they've realized that um, it might be better to kind of outsource this to, to a group that, that is already doing ratings. So I think this is part of uh, that, that first step. You guys were famous for a while for being the country that banned GTA outright and, you know, there mm. were some games you just absolutely could not get there, which created a bunch of black market stuff. It's yep. some of that stuff is softening a little bit. 
over there? Well, yeah, actually, GTA we always got through because it was big, a big enough title that they'd recode it for us. So, uh, yeah, there, there were certain things. I'm sure you can kind of guess some of the things that were removed from GTA uh, in the past to make it uh, go on sale in Australia. But, yeah, um, yeah, we've always managed to somehow get GTA, but it was Left 4 Dead and things like that where uh, the gore was taken out for, for the Australian market. Gotcha. And that is a look at the headlines. All right. Uh, if you don't know, Minecraft is huge in education. Nonprofit Common Sense Media, which runs the education review site Graphic Graphite, uh, gives Minecraft its highest rating for learning. Uh, Teacher Gaming's Minecraft EDU makes a custom edition of Minecraft for classroom use that it sells to schools at a discount. Uh, in fact, today... Minecraft EDU, or, t or teaching games that makes it, announced Computercraft EDU, which uses programmable turtles to teach computational thinking. It'll, you can have the turtle automatically do things and some, extend some things that you would usually do in Minecraft. Last week, you may have seen uh, kicking around the headline that Youth Digital out of North Carolina announced Server Design 1, uh, a course that teaches kids 8 to 14 to code, develop apps, and design 3D modeling using Minecraft. It's a $250 a year subscription for your curriculum, your tools, and your hosting. And then today, making the headlines, is that Microsoft has launched, finally, education.minecraft.net, uh, a resource center for educators with updates on programs, camps, lesson plans, etc. Uh, a lot of people wondered when Microsoft bought Mojang if they would, in fact, continue the educational push and what the relationship with teacher gaming would be. And Scott, I know this caught your eye, and I know your son is big into Minecraft here. Uh, it looks like Microsoft has taken a step down the road. Yeah, I mean, it, it does make sense. And when they bought the game and bought Mojang and paid that incredible sum of money for it, um, one of the first thoughts I have was they've got a lot of vertical and horizontal movement they can make with this. It isn't just simply, well, let's keep riding the success of a video game and bring in sequels or added content or whatever. Um, it started to become clear that they could do much more with it. And the, the capacity for that game and for that environment to teach spatial skills and uh, abstract thinking skills uh, a great example of that was this recent uh, largest, I think world record holding largest piece of art created in Minecraft was a recreation of the Queen of Blades from StarCraft, uh, a, a semi sort of famous painting from an artist at Blizzard, but recreated using nothing but Minecraft blocks and created this gigantic, beautiful, pull out a little bit and you wouldn't know the difference between it and the painting sort of mural, just absolutely mind-blowing. It's a very strange kind of abstract thing to do. And Minecraft's got this sort of capacity to be anything from just a simple block builder for young children to something complex and interesting, people building entire computers within Minecraft with functioning you know, synapses and essentially making rudimentary brains using the, the, the simple functions that the game provides. And that range of possibility kind of just as a game, unless you have the, the, the I guess, the money and the wherewithal to take it someplace else. And who on this earth, but, but Microsoft and a few other companies maybe have the wherewithal to do that and make it you know, a mass market to have the influence you need to get it into schools. I think this is a huge deal, and the fact that they're spearheading this is nothing but good. Uh, the state government in Adelaide, Australia, is funding the Perfect National Park Competition using Minecraft. So if you're in grades four through seven, uh, they want you to create using something that, that could actually be implemented. So a park full of cats would not be practical. But uh, uh, they, they say the prize is a full day's excursion to Bel Air National Park. And they're announcing the winner on July 13th. So that, that's another example of how you can use Minecraft in ways that aren't even related necessarily to coding. Like we've got tons of examples of teachers using it to teach coding and as Scott said, uh, spatial relationships, but you can use it for all kinds of things. Yeah, it really, it feels like Minecraft is kind of the, the promise of what Second Life was supposed to be all those years ago. Like, uh, poor old Second Life was far too early and, uh, um, and kind of creepy in, in many ways. Um, whereas Minecraft kind of came in the other direction. It was, it was um, you know, it was something for kids. It was an, a learning tool. Uh, I don't know, it just, it, it, it has seemed to have grabbed that, that, you know, that second online space. Um, and, yeah, I think, uh, Scott, you're absolutely right that, um, Minecraft, uh, sorry, Microsoft seems to be the perfect, perfect kind of patron for, for this technology. Um, I, I, I was really worried that when they purchased Minecraft as well, that they, 
I, I thought it would be neglect. That's what I was worried about when it came to, to Microsoft purchasing them. But it, it clearly shows, uh, I think all of these announcements show that uh, Microsoft saw the potential, bought it for the bought Minecraft for the right reasons. Um, and, yeah, it's, it, it looks amazing. Um, I'd, I'd really love to see if they, you know, I, I'd love to see more of this. I'd love to see, say, um, Azure... Uh, you know, uh, ways to teach kids how to set up servers, Minecraft servers in Azure, oh, yeah. and things yeah. like that. I mean, one of the things you could do, you could take real-world, actual, uh, you know, educational examples and say, we mm -hmm. mimic this or model this in Minecraft in some way, and do it in yeah. way that kids just light up. And Tom mentioned my son, who's way into it. It's interesting how I've seen him go from young kid who's way into it to now an early teenager who's taking what inspired and moving on to things like building stuff in the Unreal Engine and getting his head around Unity 5 and, and yeah. building models within those worlds and making them move and making rudimentary shooters and like he wants to, he wants to go further and I'm 100% sure that Minecraft played a role mm -hmm. in, in, in his sort of, you know, his little uh, path of inspiration and you're right about the neglect thing. That was a real fear. They've done it before. You know, they've come in, they swooped in, they buy a big developer, especially in video games, they buy somebody like Rare Software, and then they let Rare just languish and sit there. One of the most important developers in the history of video games, doing nothing. They seem to be rectifying that soon, but, but, um, but they've got a history of doing that, buying this stuff out, letting it sit, selling it off, whatever. This is all good news. The fact that they use it as a primary example of how HoloLens can function uh, on stage and otherwise is... Is, is, is a sign that they're seeing Minecraft as more than just a game and seeing it as something far bigger than that. So, so to me, this is all good news. It fits right in with Sacha Nadella's kind of new outlook for the company, uh, and it takes them in places that are much less giant, scary corporation and way more, you know, let's help teach kids how to do stuff. Well, I'm going to rain on the parade a little bit here, and I apologize in advance, but I think that's my job. A, I bet we're going to get some teachers writing in saying, well, Scott and Peter, we already do that thing that you suggested we should do, and here's an example. And I hope they do, because I want to see those examples. Uh, I know when I started researching this story, there's a lot more going on in the educational community with Minecraft than I knew about. And I knew a little bit was going on, uh, but it is widespread. It's been there. It's been doing fine without Microsoft. Mm. And that's the fear is that Microsoft was going to ignore it. Well, today Microsoft started this resource center. That's great. Okay, they're not going to ignore it. But why aren't they mentioning teacher gaming? Why isn't teacher gaming putting this up on their website? Uh, why is teacher gaming having an announcement that goes on the same day as this without any crosstalk. It, Teacher Gaming's website says they are the authorized Mojang provider, which that said before Microsoft owned Mojang, says nothing about Microsoft. So I'm skeptical about why these two aren't talking more. Mm. Is Microsoft going to undercut them with their own product, which is the old style of Microsoft doing things, and I don't want to see that happen when you have this fantastic resource here. So hopefully this is just something that hasn't been worked out yet, and they'll figure it out. Yeah, that'd be cool if they approached it like education with hardware. You know, these companies like Apple and Microsoft and others, uh, when, when schools back in the 80s started to say, well, look, let's get some of these machines in here. We want these in for our curriculum. No, nobody was spearheading a, an educational program at Apple or IBM or anywhere else. This came from that grassroots place, and then they said, you know what? What about mass pricing discounts? What about service contracts? Why don't we make it easier for them to get these in class? What about one iPad per kid? What about an Android tablet for every kid in this class or whatever? So they, they've jumped on it that way. It'd be really cool if Microsoft did something similar and said, we've got these initiatives, we're putting a bunch of money behind this, but also... We're going to make this real easy for teachers to get to use in the ways they want to use it. So I'm with you 100%. That is, that's a fear, but I think they could belay that fear pretty quick. Because Minecraft EDU is doing all those things you said, and they've been doing it for years without Microsoft's help because Mojang let Minecraft be open and let mm -hmm. people do it and then gave mm -hmm. support only where it was needed. Yeah. And I hope Microsoft will keep that tradition going. Let's see our pick of the day from Nick, who said he was browsing new releases on the Xbox One store and found out there's a new free tune-in radio app. While I'm sure the traditional radio content is great, I downloaded the app for Alpha Geek Radio. Talking about, we didn't talk a lot about Apple Radio. Get some tune-in radio. Get some Alpha Geek Radio. He says, with this tune-in app, I can get Alpha Geek Radio and its great geeky content on my Xbox One, including DTNS. What more could one want? I agree. It's totally cool. And I've used it and tried it, and it's great. And there's integration with uh, Echo with TuneIn. 
So I can talk to my Amazon Echo in the kitchen and say, play most recent episode of DTNS, and it will do it. Wow. Good job, Alexa. Yeah. Play DTNS. <laughs> I think we just screwed up a bunch of people to have this on their speakers. Sorry about that. <laughs> Send your picks to feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com, and you can find my picks at dailytechnewsshow.com slash picks. Okay, all our emails are about Apple Music. Sorry, folks. You guys wrote them. Uh, well, some of you did. Rich from lovely Cleveland. Full disclosure, he is a DJ on WRUW Cleveland, a college station, and therefore has, he says, uh, I have not undue bitterness toward commercial radio. However... He says, I think the reason people are trying to make a big deal out of Beats 1 is because of the severely deprecated state of terrestrial radio, at least in the U.S. Aside from the usual morning zoo and drive time shock jock, commercial radio has gone to great lengths to take the experience of curation away and make it as mechanical as possible. There are several stations in Cleveland that don't even have DJs, just robot voices telling you the song name and artist between each track. I think there's a really interested audience that wants a curated experience from someone that's enthusiastic or at least good at pretending to be about sharing new and interesting music. Interesting. Um, Peter, what's your take on this? We talked about on, on TMS with Tom as well about, you know, Ooh. where radio's at today, that it's kind of stable, at least here in the States. And uh, there is a sense that it's very commercialized and also very automated, but it's kind of holding its yeah, own yeah. weird way. How, what's, what's your take on the whole state of things that way? Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I've got a I've got a huge soft spot for Triple J, which is um, a, a national radio station down in Australia that is kind of like a college radio. Like it's got the same kind of vibe, but it's um, it's a national station in this. Uh, it's it's you know uh, supported by the government, but uh, to promote uh, you know young younger Australian bands. Um, and it, it's uh, you know it really has played a large role in shaping the kind of the musical taste of this country um, and you can really see that that you know uh, when a band becomes popular on Triple J they become popular in Australia mu much more than they are sometimes in their home markets um, which is a really fascinating thing to watch so someone like Faith No More for instance as a weird this is you know my age um, but you know Faith No More was uh, would always say when they were out in Australia that they were much bigger here than they were anywhere else in the world because of the support Triple J would give them. So, you know, it really is, uh, it's, it's fascinating that um, radio can have that power. Um, and, and I kind of miss that. Like, I, it's been a long time since I've tuned into a radio station. So I am kind of excited to see what Beats 1 brings to, uh, brings to the table. I, I think the first day was a little bit wonky, as I'm sure some people did when they were listening to, to some of those callbacks. <clears throat> Sorry, <clears throat> I'm losing my voice here. But... Um, yeah, no, I, I really, I, I'm kind of interested to see how it all plays out. Do you guys have um, a, a college radio station that is kind of of that scope? Is, is there, I mean, I, I know about... Not you know, national, what, no, I don't think so. There's okay. lots of local ones. There's lots of local independent radio stations, lots of local college radio stations that are similar, but not one that's like across the entire country, you know? Yeah. Okay. And, there, and that's, I mean, that's what I think they want Beats One to do is provide that experience again, or at least get a taste of that back in people's mouths of, of a curated, mm -hmm. human driven thing. Um, Tom, Tom gave a great example this morning, and I think he already talked about it on DTNS, but this, this idea that you put a little story behind what you're doing with the music, and then the music means a little something more, and you're, you're listening more, and there's a real opportunity there. And not having it interrupted by 15 lawyer commercials and other stupid things that you normally get in a local market yeah. uh, makes a big difference. But it is still a little strange, as fascinated as I am with it, it's a little strange to see a world that's moving more and more toward on-demand content of all kinds in sub-genres of a million types. I mean, my podcast yeah. examples of that, for sure. And yet, here's this thing that's trying to make sure they get as many genres in as they can on a single live radio station that doesn't have anything you can go back to and listen again except songs. You know, you can go back and you can say, oh, I like this song and save it and put it on a playlist. But you can't like go back and hear a conversation the DJ had with somebody. It's a little weird in 2015 that that's a thing. So it, we'll I think it's weird, but I think it's kind of um, you know it, it's a natural cycle. You know, in, in the same way that when when everyone started listening to to music on their iPods and suddenly they were only listening to the music they had with them um, and kind of in a way locking themselves out of all other sounds uh, in the city. I, I think that's why podcasting um, kind of took off as it did in those early years because, you know, people suddenly, after years of just listening to nothing but their iPod, wanted to hear a voice again. And I kind of feel that this is the same thing happening here again, that after after years of allowing a computer to create the uh, the perfect playlist for you, um, we're kind of 
you know, we're almost desperate to, to get a bit of uh, human interaction again and a, a little bit more uh, of curation back into, into, the, uh, into listening to music. Now, Jemuel uh, wrote in from sunny, sometimes rainy Trinidad and said, more important to me than if Spotify, RDO, Google Music, Xbox Music, or Apple Music is better than the other is which one is available in Trinidad. So as nice as the debate about which works the best or has the most users today or has the best features, what really matters is availability. Apple Music launched in 100 countries on day one. Before today, if I wanted streaming music, I had no options. I tried using a DNS proxy to get Spotify for a while, but it stopped working. I don't see the rest of the other services going worldwide anytime soon. So even if Apple is not number one in the US, they still might end up with the most users simply because it's available in more places. And he says, side note, the price is cheaper here too. $5.99 US, that's $39 Trinidad. Uh, so maybe we should use proxies to subscribe to their Trinidad. <laughs> Uh, well, one thing real quick in the chat room from uh, that just sort of speaks to this as well is The Fixer who says, when it comes to Apple Music, I absolutely hate that some of the DJs feel the need to talk over the song and you get the basic uh, Beats 1 promo over the music all the time too. If you want to talk about a song, do it before or after, not during. And I would just say, A, I agree, but B, it's also kind of an international style of doing that. Like, I, well, I it's also, on. if you want to hear the songs without talking over them, then listen to your own playlist. Right. I guess what the fixer's saying is he wants to hear the talking, just not over the songs. That's a different style of, of radio, and that's the problem, right? Somebody else loves that style. They think it's more fun, and waiting until the song is over to talk sounds boring to them. So you, you can't make one station that, that fits everybody, because especially when you're talking international... Uh, not, mm. It's not going to be. It's not going to work for everybody. I listen to a lot of house music on like British shoutcast streams, and they do this all the time. And it's at first annoying, but I kind of got used to it. But it also just felt like a flavor of that type of thing. And these are very internationally focused DJs, so it doesn't surprise me. But bringing it back to uh, Jemuel's point, uh, Peter, are, are there a lot of competing music services that you have in Australia? We do now have pretty much everyone um, that all, all the all the majors are down here now. Um, but but I do think it is actually a good point. I I follow a bunch of um, guys from India uh, in on my Twitter stream, and uh, and they were they were all saying that uh, the uh, Beats subscription price in India is about two dollars US a month, um, and and they were really really impressed by by Apple kind of understanding what their market could afford. Um, so yeah, like a. a um, I think that that is one thing to definitely uh, praise Apple for in this rollout. That you know sometimes you know uh, we we started the show making fun of how international for uh, Apple sometimes means you know the the Bay Area and a little bit more. Um, but uh, in in this particular case, it is uh, you know they've clearly understood every market that they're they're uh, launching into. Um, you know, and that that's that, that's something that only a company as gigantic as Apple could probably pull off. Finally, Marlon, the guy from Trinidad, wrote in and wanted to share a link that he said, at least at the time, it con he confirmed it worked. Uh, it's a link to the direct HTTPS feed of Beats One Radio that you can use on anything, including an Android phone. Now, I know uh, the Apple Music app is supposed to be coming to Android later this year, but a lot of people have been using this link, uh, to, be, or this link to be able to listen to it. And Marlon said... What concerns me, what I really want to ask, is this just a bug or should we be concerned about Apple and security? Well, no, you can do, I could, okay, so right now, ladies and gentlemen, I could, I could do this. Hold on here. Let me just do this. Oh, I won't be able to play. Hold on. Here we go. I could do this right now. Everybody who's smart knows that's ACDC in the first part of Hell's Bells. Okay, that's back in black. One of the best rock and roll albums ever made. Now, if I wanted to, I have the wherewithal, the bandwidth, the hardware, and the software to, to hit play on that, have an internal playlist, or to play Beats 1 right now and pipe that through a, a million ways of getting it up on a URL and boom, everyone's got access to my, to my Beats radio. Um, that's something that I don't think Apple or anybody can control. They can try to shut it down, but isn't that all that's happening here? No, it's actually, it's actually simpler than that. This is the actual stream URL uh, mm. that people have figured out from looking at, looking at the code somewhere. Uh, that they've extracted because <laughs> what we forget is that apps really are just kind of super cool web pages uh, <laughs> in, in, in a way. And, and, and that's oversimplifying it. Obviously, there's more to apps than just that. But all this Beats One radio stream is is a link to a stream somewhere. 
And the yeah. way the internet was built was to link to stuff. So all that happened, I don't think this is a security issue at all. All that happened is somebody figured out how to get to that link. And all Apple's going to have to do is, fig is realize, oh, wait a minute, we, we need to set some more conditions about when that link can actually be accessed and, and have an identifier that makes sure it's the actual app if they want to shut it down. But this is actually not a security issue. This is just the internet working the way it's supposed to. That link, who's irumble.com? That's what's confusing me because I think this is just some guy's guy's link to his website or something. Sorry, Peter, I interrupted you. Go ahead. Well, yeah, you uh, may so be right about this link. I've seen other ones out there too, though. Yeah, and, and we see this, uh, you know, whenever Apple does a, uh, a live stream, uh, they generally say that you can only watch it in Safari or on an Apple TV, but, um, yeah, the, someone always pulls out the, the MP4 stream, which is just a, uh, yeah, like you were saying, Tom, just a link that sits on Apple CDN, and you can just grab that and throw that in any browser, and it works. So, um, yeah, this, is, this just sounds like, a link. That, that, is a, yeah. that is all it is. It's just a link back but even, to But even if it's not, Scott's right. I mean, it also is just music, which you can rebroadcast. It's not legal, no. but mm -hmm. it's going to happen. Yeah, people are going to do it. People hijack streams. And like Periscope is being blamed for all kinds of issues right now where they're, you know, capturing live con concert stuff or whatever and they're not authorized to. Or there's <laughs> the, the final episode of Game of Thrones is being you know, periscoped onto some guy's friends list or whatever, and it doesn't look great, but hey, they're still seeing the content, and uh, sadly, we are, we are in that time, man. You can find this stuff if you want it. And uh, T2T2, just put the M3U link into the chat room. So, uh, yeah, it's not that hard to find. Yeah. And it's, a, it's at an apple.com address. Uh, well, that is it for this episode of the Daily Tech News Show. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Peter Wells, uh, for getting up early and starting your day with us. Really appreciate it, man. Always a pleasure, sir. Always a pleasure. Actually, um, normally I don't have anything to plug, and finally I do. Uh, Fantastic. So, <laughs> um, yeah, so I've been running um, some opinion uh, opinion pieces for the Sydney Morning Herald, so uh, follow me on the Twitters and I'll share them. I have no idea what I'm doing at the moment because uh, it's it's weird writing for like a proper newspaper, but uh, it's been fun. It's been terrifying and fun. So, yeah, follow me on the Twitters. Follow him on Twitter and then look for what? Is it smh.com.au? smh.com.au, yes. And indeed. look around for a Peter Wells byline. That's fantastic. Yes, it's it. been good fun. That's really, that's really <laughs> exciting. Congrats, man. That's awesome. Uh, Scott you. Johnson can be found at frogpants.com. You can follow him on Twitter, twitter.com slash Scott Johnson. I still remember the sushi restaurant I was sitting in the day Scott announced he was changing his Twitter name to Scott Johnson. Oh, remember that? I was terrified that day. You know, yeah, I was in Hawaii freaking out. <laughs> Well, it was brave new territory, man. Nobody had done it in our little circle, and I had to take the I had to take the hit. Uh, well, you did well with it, and folks could, should go follow him. Anything else uh, going on? You want to let folks? Well, I was about? afraid that today was going to be Scott's going to push his Kickstarter because he's worried about making it in 30 days. But we funded in the first 18 hours, and we've already hit our first stretch goal. And I just want to say that if people are interested in a compilation book of my near 15 year old comic I've been doing for the last 15 years, which is redundant. Uh, head on over to uh, myextralife.com slash book and uh, you can see all about it. And uh, those listening who have helped, just huge thanks. I'm kind of blown away this week. So I'm a big fan of the cartoon and I can say without reservation that I went and backed that Kickstarter definitely to get the book first yeah. and there then to help my, my buddy Scott out second. But I, I, it, my impulse was like, I want, which is the reward level that gets me the book was what I looked for first. So. Right. Well, I, I completely appreciate that. And, and again, thank you to everybody who supported it. It's been a wild ride, but we're excited about it. Go check it out. It's what? My, what is it? MyExtralife.com my slash book? Slash book. Yep. It'll take you straight to the Kickstarter, give you all the details. There's stretch goals to hit and awesome things to do. So head on over. All right, folks, I could sit here and I could tell you about all the ways to contact the show. Feedback at DailyTechNewsShow.com. Call us 51259-DAILY. Listen to the show live Monday through Friday, Alpha Geek Radio. But I'm not going to do that because you can find it at our website, DailyTechNewsShow.com. We're worldwide. We're always on. We're Daily Tech News Show. The show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at FrogPants.com. Dan Patterson's on tomorrow. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> <laughs> you're and you've got that in your blood, Tom. That is amazing. I agree. <laughs> to do that. It's just a, you've always had the DJ, uh, the heart of a DJ, man. Yeah, and I actually uh, like. I don't. I don't go into my radio voice thing because I feel like it's one of those things that I enjoy more than other people do. <laughs> so when I find an opportunity to to play with it, it is really fun. 
do do an on the hour callback for us. Just one. Just one. Do the what? Like an on the hour callback, you know. So so just an oh, an like it's and, it's and the weather and the yeah. Two nineteen on the home of rock and roll WPG. You look at it, seventy degrees in Champaign, Illinois today. That was ACDC back in black, which we're going to have on lunch tomorrow with Paul Maloney. Check that out as well. Let's kick it off with another thirty minutes commercial free with the, the vinyls on uh, Rock One O Seven WPGU. Good lord. Love me, love me, say that. <laughs> <laughs> that's crazy uh hey that was a good show what are we gonna call it i know there were a lot of suggestions in there oh yeah we've got um the top vote getter right now from dr Payne uh is parks and education which i really like uh t 2 t 2 coming in second with physical denial of service attacks <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> 40 Thieves has more worldwide than Apple. Then we have Mindcraft from Dark Redeemer. And Fingerless Snapping from Beatmaster. Oh, which I didn't Mindcraft, uh, uh, what's his name's gig on YouTube? Uh, Chad's? Chad Johnson? Um, maybe. Yeah, I think it is. Oh, it's OMG Craft, but does he also do Mindcraft? Mind, uh, you may be like right. A collective or something called Mindcraft? Yeah, I think so. I think that's part of the... I may not remember that right, but... Bring it How about snapping without fingers? Yeah, I get it now. Sorry, I missed Oh, that. Snapchat, right. Right. Oh, just another pretty Facebook. Uh, <laughs> Daily Vol News Show. <laughs> <laughs> I love a good Vol metaphor. You should not apologize. That was awesome. <laughs> You've also, we've also got 40 Thieves with... Sacha Mania. Ah, a spin on the old Sacha Mania. Yeah. yeah. Mindcrack, T2T2 T2 T2 says. Never, so we're mm -hmm. good. We're, we're safe with Mindcraft. Although somebody must have done that. Yeah. Like it's, it's, it's too good not to have been thought of, I would think. Crafting the education of mining. Um, yeah, I think we've got some getters. We've got some getters in there. I, parks and education or physical denial of service attacks are yeah. my my two favorites out of there. I can go either way. I like the physical one. I think that's pretty good. T2, T2 with the win, in my opinion. Yeah, Do we have any objections? Going motion, on. motion is carried. I'm going to allow this. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, most importantly, have we all seen the trailer for Creed? Yes. You know what? Yes. Uh, why am I so excited about that? I really want to see it now. I'm I haven't. I'm super no. excited about it. It's cool. It's, why have I not seen that? What happened? Uh, it rocky, snuck out last night. Yeah. Oh, okay. The kind of Rocky sequel I give a poop about. I think that's it's, cool. It's oh, so it's not about great. the band? <laughs> no, no. But the band keeps beating it in SEO on YouTube, which is really interesting. <laughs> that is interesting. Uh, it looks cool. Yeah, it's super exciting. I'm super excited for it, and not just because my friend's brother is in it. Uh, kind of glad uh, he's not directing it, Sly. Uh, yeah. Just act in it and do his thing, and that's good. Oh, spoiler. The trailer's kind of a spoiler if I say that, but yeah, he's in it. <laughs> what? It's about what? Rocky? Oh, spoiler. The kid, It's the Human Torch and Rocky. In the movie. Yeah. <laughs> hey. It's the kid from Friday Night Lights, not the Human Torch. Come on. Actually, Yo, the best Adrian. part, no, this the guy best is a part flame. about it is that his trainer is Avon Barksdale. Oh. So we finally answered the question, where's Wallace? There's Wallace. We found <laughs> there him. There he is. He's with Avon. It's okay. <laughs> no, Peter, for real, he's the new Torch. He's the, the one that's well, not I out. Know, I know, but yeah, but you know, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, I just love Michael B. Jordan. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, I should give him more credit. He's awesome. He, yeah. Friday Night Lights was... Oh, dude, uh, Scott Johnson is a big Friday Night Lights fan, uh, yeah. Peter. He's the whole reason that I started watching it, because he sent me the DVDs. Yeah, still one of the best. Sent that's me DVDs. That's the lengths he went to get me to watch. Yeah. <laughs> Fair Remember, enough. If you anything you want Tom to see, just send him DVDs. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, wow. Friday Night Lights is Physical the absolute copies? best ever portrayal of a marriage on television. Oh, I oh, yeah, yeah. Not the, disagree. Just the best thing ever. Yeah. Also, so now, if you watch... Nashville and Deadline at the same time, you kind of get. <laughs> I can't. It's just too painful. Somewhere out there, Coach and Mrs. Coach are living on the East Coach Coast. Coach Taylor. Have a great yep. time. Yeah. Coach and Mrs. Coach. 
I love that it's Coach and Mrs. Coach. Yeah, that, that is the greatest thing ever. <laughs> I want to watch it again. I'm supposed to watch the West Wing. Again. Oh, no. Let's. Oh. How about us? There's nothing on TV. Let's all have a summer watch a fest. Did you give up you on. No, actually, I've. I, I never, I've never actually watched all of I just, Friday Night I just couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. Couldn't do it. All right. I want to let it stand as I am. I have failed the leftovers because I, you know what it was? I went to see the trailer for the new season. I was like, if the trailer for the new season excites me, I will watch the leftovers. And then I saw it. I was like, this is still boring. And I couldn't do it. <laughs> you know what Eileen's been watching is Grace and Frankie on Netflix. Oh, my wife yeah, loves really good. Yeah, she just thinks it's hilarious. Yeah, my wife loves. We have uh, we have an upcoming episode of Tell It Anyway featuring a writer from Grace's, Grace and Frankie. Oh, very cool. Cool. Good friend we'll of mine. Tell it Go subscribe now. We'll Don't tell miss it that anyway. episode. Com. Will it be all? I can never get around it. It'll be all about Editing. Lily Tomlin as a national treasure. Is that what it'll be about? No, but there are, there will be a Jane Fonda anecdote. How about oh, that? Okay. Well, my my work here is done then. Oh, yeah. Anna Martin Sheen anecdote. Oh wow. He was in. Yeah. You really are missing out if you don't subscribe. I'm oh, just saying. and an Elaine Stritch story that's possibly my favorite thing I've ever heard. Wow. Yeah, this is going to be a good episode. I just got to edit it. Peter, are you subscribed <laughs> to Tell It Anyway? I will do that right now. <laughs> All right. You'll like it. It's good. <laughs> it is really good. <laughs> I am a favorite. Out of it. it has its weeks. I love it when there, there, there are things that I try out or I listen to because they're friends of mine. And I don't necessarily think, I'm not trying to say they're bad, but I just like, oh, okay, that, that's really good. And, and they don't hook me. But the instant, tell it anyway, uh, ask Veronica, they are all things I look forward to every week. Yeah. Like, you guys could even stop being on them. And I think, well, they probably would fall apart. <laughs> but but it's, not, it's not because I know you. It's because I really just like this. Yeah, that is the nice thing about having friends like this is we all actually really like things each other does. Mm-hmm. We're not just in it for the, I don't know. I mean, that current geek show you do, I, I can't stand listening to that. Oh, man. That <laughs> current geek show, I love. It's like a rotting vole in the window well. It's good writing. <laughs> I'll give it that. But... I don't even know what a vole is. What the hell? <laughs> it's like a fat mouse. It's like a, it's like a mouse uh, mixed with like a, a, like a mouse and a groundhog. Yeah. It's a yeah. really English word for a, for a rodent. Like, yeah. Kind of like a possum. Very British. They suck because they, they, they make tunnels in your lawn and stuff like that. They're mm. terrible creatures. But they're also kind of cute. And this one that died, I feel bad. He's just laying there. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, um, see that big white light there in the background? That's sun. That, the sun. Yeah, that That's means tough. the sun's come up. So that means I should probably go, get, go to work. So bye. Go enjoy <laughs> the Friday sun. Yeah. Thanks thank for coming you. on the show. Bye. I got a yeah, thank you, Peter, as always, man. Yeah. Always great fun. Bye. Cheers. Love me, love me, say that you love. Oh, I have to do show notes. There's no coming out of here. another thirty-minute rock block. <laughs> Shit. Because <laughs> I was worried about show notes. I just, I, I'm so used to not doing them now that I forgot. So hold on. Yeah. I it's will. Funny how habits it's change. Funny how that happens. Um, I think I hear Martin Sheen's voice upstairs. Another Grace and Frankie must be spinning. Okay. Um, what was I looking for? Oh, the show notes. The uh, home of rock and roll. Oh, speaking of uh, FSL, are you requiring assistance in any way? I don't think so for this okay. set, but we will be. I, in fact, Justin and I have got to hash that out. Uh, we're flying by the seat of our pants a little bit right now because of both our schedules. But yeah, our intention is to a need particular help uh, on episodes, but also to do another call on episode. Okay, yeah, just uh, just let me know and let Matt know and things like. And that. you have access to that doc, so if you yes, ever just want to go in and and come up with something and send it All to right. us, that's Hammond. Uh, you know Hammond Scott. Uh, Hammond's been doing that. Do He's I just know? been sending me calls. I, I think you met Hammond at Nerdtacular last year. It is entirely possible. I'm sorry, Hammond. I, 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 <laughs> I don't remember anything anymore. It's, it happens memory, when... is, memory is gone. What's gone? A memory. Oh, I don't. Memory is gone. I don't know what that is. I can't remember. What? Well, who are you? What are we talking about? 
<laughs> so Scott left. Oh, I didn't even notice. Yeah, Scott, oh, Scott did the 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 he he went out with Peter Wells. They oh, went okay. out together in a blazing They're going in a out blaze together? of glory. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, he's got he's a busy guy. He's got stuff to do. Busy guy. He's got stuff to do. Uh, Places to be. I'm just waiting for SoundCloud to process the track and then I'm done. That's all right. I'm really behind on show notes, so that's okay. Oh. Uh, let's see. What else have we got going on? What have we got? It's July 1st. Thanks, bosses. Oh, thank you, bosses. I super appreciate that. Uh, also, I confused some people when I was saying that the YouTube channel moved to Daily Tech News Show. Uh, some people are like, so how do I get that as a podcast? If you're getting this as a podcast, first of all, it's because Sean does it and he's awesome. It's unofficial. Uh, and second of all, you don't have to do anything. We didn't move the podcast. We only moved the YouTube channel. Mm. But the YouTube channel did move. And so, yeah, I, I think I would confuse people when I said, so if you want to get it faster, you go to Daily Tech News Show. And so the podcast people are like, oh, I can get it faster. <laughs> like, well, no, you can only get it faster YouTube oh, style, not podcast style, sadly. Uh, I updated uh, our about page a little bit. Um, oh, I, I updated our, it too. Yeah. Um, I, I changed the our, YouTube links. Yeah, you did that. I saw. I went in to do that, and then I saw you already did that, and oh, okay. so I did something else. Okay, good. Um, I was hoping I just updated, we did no, 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 no. Like cross changed. streams. Right. Uh, I did like a couple of updates on who our people are, but I think that. Um, that we could use a little fresher on that page. Like if our people want to go in there and do their bios properly, mm -hmm. I guess that's an option. They could just send it to me. I'm going to put that in Slack. Um, yeah, that's a good idea. Else. Veronica Belmont, host of Buzz Out Loud. Yeah, it's kind of dated. We need. Yeah, it's kind of dated. We need, we need to update that. It's Veronica Belmont, student at Emerson College and intern at ZDNet. <laughs> What? That's not right. Um, let's see. Should, what else? I, I don't know why SoundCloud is taking forever, but it's taking forever. Uh, right now, it's a really good time for trailers, which is exciting. Have you noticed just, just like so many good trailers out? Because it's starting to become Oscar movie trailer time. Oh, is that right? Is that why? Yeah, it's pretty exciting. I Oh, sorry. I was making noise. Uh, I've got some here. I'll plug that in. You want to hear a little tease? I'll do a little FSL tease. Oh, yeah. Out of context, I'll give you two things that will be on upcoming episodes of FSL. This is time travel. If you don't know FSL tonight, it's a weekly sports show. Why is that not working? Come on. Come on. All right, hold on. Whoa. Oh, that, was, that actually worked more than I thought. I have 7 million versions of this now. Well, that's interesting. Uh, it's a weekly sports show covering a fantasy and science fiction sports league. The Ponyville Phillies are a team. The uh, Cheyenne Mountain Gators are a team. Uh, the New York Avengers, for instance, are a team. Mm -hmm. How would you describe it, Jenny? Uh, I would describe it as a... Uh, FSL tonight is a sports center like wrap up for teams in a league of their own fantasy team leagues. Right. Not Real in teams. A, not in a league of their own Madonna kind of way. Yeah. But no, that would not be good. <laughs> Although <laughs> uh, they might make it someday. Uh, and so it's essentially a recap of a, a very serious league of an unspecified game. Uh, that has rules and they play and sports. They play sports. They play a sport, mm -hmm. and uh, Tom and Justin follow them and keep you updated on everything that they do. And it's all quite smart. All right, so here, here's one thing. This is the best shot I'll ever have. Oh, so exciting! And here's another thing. I'm the one and only Rainbow Dash, and this is my <laughs> minute. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> so there you go. Just a couple of teases. Uh, yes, fantasy as sword. Not so much fantasy as in football, although a little bit. A yeah. little bit. Uh, and that is it. Uh, so I hear that Patreon is having some issues processing some people's pledges. They say they can't process a pledge even though the, uh, the, the information is up to date. I will try to find out from them 
what's happening because I am as interested in you in that working. Uh, and so just what I would say is I've had things where Patreon's had a bug and Tyler and Sean and all those guys have been great at just getting on it and fixing it and making it right as soon as possible. So I will keep you updated. Uh, but if you are getting a, an alert saying there's a problem with your pledge, uh, just let them know that you got it, you know, as I'm sure most of you have. Uh, and then hang in there for a couple of days uh, and, and see if they get it resolved. My, my guess is that they will. So anyway, uh, apologies for that. Uh, and thank you for your support. Stay tuned because coming up is, what is coming up? Oh, today is, is it uh, Dear Veronica and also Roberto's show, My So-Called 8-Bit Life. Oh, right. Uh, right after another 30-minute rock block, starting off with Delight. <laughs> 